with reaching the physique goals that a lot of people want to reach, a lot of times I see people where they'll be training really hard in the gym, but they feel a little bit lost when it comes to nutrition. Do you see that a lot with your clients? I do. I think that nutrition is very challenging because it is a, a big topic. Mm -hmm. Training can, you can, you can make training very, very simple and you can make nutrition simple as well, but nutrition can be very daunting because of multiple factors. But I think a big one is in part to the marketing and those different mm -hmm. things of where we have this low fat or, or healthy thing being labeled and people gravitate towards it, but it may not be the best option. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of misinformation and misclassification of food. And and it is very much of marketing of you see things labeled low carb, healthy, low fat, and it just are low in calories. And you're like, ooh, I should have that because it's better for me. So I wanted to go over some questions that we had gotten about nutrition and really just be able to shed some light on some different nutrition topics. Let's make it happen. All right. Number one, how do I calculate my macros? There's a couple of, couple of different ways that you can do this. I think that the absolute best approach is going to be tracking your current intake and then being able to make adjustments from whatever that may be um, moving forward. So you track your current food for one to two weeks, and then from there, be able to create a maintenance calories from that intake and then make adjustments to that intake from there. So I have to like put effort forth. You're not just going to like give me magic numbers. That should be exactly what's going to get me the results that I want. Correct. I think that that's going to be something of, of challenge for many individuals to take the time to track for those few weeks just to get a good baseline. Now, there are, you know, some things that present in doing this because as you track your food, you're going to be more mindful of your nutrition than what you normally are because it's going to be right in front of your face. And so this is something I use with my one-on-one -on -one clients as well is that as we get started, they are utilizing or they're tracking to let me know where their maintenance calories are at the moment. And what ends up happening is that they actually take less calories in. And if we're starting with a calorie deficit, I'm using that lower intake from what they ended up eating. And then we're getting in too deep of a deficit because of their starting point actually, you know, coming to me lower than what it should have been. And so a kind of workaround here is that I have clients tracking in their notes app first of just like, just put the food that you ate, the quantity, all those things at the end of the night, put it into my fitness pal so that you're not happen or, you know, by subconscious eating less than what you normally would eat and trying to keep it as close as possible. And I've had better success with that. And I, I do think that it is just so helpful for people to see what their true baseline is because I'll even have clients and they have their macros that are assigned to them maybe once we've gotten where their baseline is. But like with the example of going into a deficit, I might have someone at a certain macro intake, but if they're not hitting that each week, I'm not starting from those macros to create the deficit. I'm starting from where you have truly hit your food. And so there's a big difference even if you do find out what your macros are to what you're actually eating. And so I think that it is the best case scenario. If you have no idea where your macro should be or what they should be, go ahead and track for that one to two weeks. Just figure out, look, reflect, and see, hey, what things are high? What things are low? What do I want to change from here? Uh, we also do have a resource for this. We do have a free nutrition calculator. So I'll have that link down below. And I would highly encourage you to watch the podcast that goes along with it because it's going to tell you how to get the best results while using that macro calculator. And I want to be very clear that with us having a macro calculator, that does not make it that you should just ignore the fact that we told you to track your intake uh, to begin with, because that is going to be the best way we go over that in the podcast, talking about the macro calculator to make sure that you are also learning about food. Because to me, it doesn't matter if you have a certain macro intake, if you're, you don't have any knowledge around food. And so really being able to learn about food by just being able to reflect on it, see what different labels say, see what it looks like is going to be extremely helpful. The journey of understanding your nutrition is just like anything else. It's going to take reps and you're going to fall on your face and make mistakes early on. And so I think for the person who has not tracked before and then um, telling them to track for two weeks can be really daunting. 
because it's just a lot to take in. And then you are having to slow down much more than what you normally have been prior to that point uh, to track the food, to understand the quantities and get things scanned in, whatever the case may be. Um, but I, I do think that the repetitions are the biggest part of it and making sure that that's where the education is going to come about and you actually having the results that you want to have. A hundred percent. Okay. Number two, what is a healthy ratio of macros? This is, this is tough because when we talk about ratios, it's really going to come down to a couple of different things. Um, first is going to be preference. And the reason that I say preference is because, um, the only way that a dietary intake is going to work is that if you adhere. And so your preference is going to play a large role. And if we take the framework of utilizing the one to two weeks of caloric intake being tracked, and we take that and we understand how does that break down within our fats and our carbohydrates and our protein, that's going to give us an indication of what our preference probably is. Now, if your calories from that two week intake are coming from a place of a lot of your fats are M&Ms, Reese's, a bunch of junk food. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have a preference towards fats. You have a preference towards junk and we've got to strengthen your <laughs> Highly palate. Highly satiable food. <laughs> yeah. And so we need to not take that in, into, con well, I guess we take it into consideration, but that doesn't mean that when you set your macronutrients that you need to be fat dominant in your intake. So exclude that. But if we're in a place where you track for those two weeks and a lot of your protein sources are more fat dense protein sources, then it may be a good option for you to err on the side of a higher fat percentage intake for your total calories or macronutrients, and then having more of a moderate to lower carbohydrate option. And the same would go if you have a higher carbohydrate preference relative to the fats. Now, when it comes to protein specifically, I'm going to recommend that this stays in alignment with your total body mass and Less we are carrying an excess of, of body fat, um, high body fat percentage. And so keeping that in alignment and using that as more of your marker of this is where I'm at and this is how much protein I'm going to be taking in, and then using the percentages more so with your carbohydrates and fats specifically. Yeah. And I normally also like to state with this that there are some minimums that I like to keep in mind. And one of those are going to be for fats that we want to keep that at a minimum of 40 grams per day. And the reason for that is that fats are going to be a huge aspect in our hormonal health. And so if you take those down and you're going into the 35s, 30s and lower, then that can wreak havoc havoc on your hormones. So having that at that 40 grams minimum per day. Then when it comes to carbs, I also like to recommend that the minimum is between that 130 to 150 grams of carbs per day. And that's because there have been a lot of research that show you need at least 130 to 150 grams of carbs for your brain to function as needed. So that is not to say that you should, okay, Sue said set my macros at 40 grams of fat and 130 grams of carbs. Those are are the minimum. So to not go below that would be my biggest recommendation. The macronutrient that's not a macronutrient being fiber, I think this is important to talk about here as well, is that you would want to have 10 to 15 grams per thousand calories of intake of fiber. So just being mindful of that, we're not going to be tracking net carbs. So you're not going to be subtracting that fiber from your total carbohydrate intake. It's still going to be in part to that. So uh, just something to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. All right. How do macronutrients differ from micronutrients? The macronutrients are going to be your protein, carbs, and fats, the, the big rocks that we're going to be focusing on when tracking our total calories, and they're going to contribute to our total calories. Protein is going to be four calories, carbohydrates are going to be four calories, and then your fats are going to be nine calories, and all, those are all per gram of intake. When we talk about micronutrients, these are going to be your vitamins and minerals that are going to be making up your dietary intake, things that are going to be vital to your day-to-day -day life and your overall health, things that are often overlooked when we get into tracking our calories and tracking our macronutrients because of how 
uh, overwhelming the tracking of macronutrients can be. And so often we get very focused on those big rocks where we neglect some of those smaller rocks like the micronutrients. And we may in, in, in that process create some deficiencies because we're not having enough focus. And so I really like to utilize the approach in which we're having vegetables and fruit with each meal. It's a good way for us to at least have a base of vitamins and minerals into our diet. And then also you using a quality multivitamin in your diet will be helpful there as well to allow for all your bases to be covered when it comes to the micronutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Mm -hmm. And how I normally think about them is macro is bigger and they are needed in larger quantities by your body. Micro is smaller and they're needed in smaller quantities by your body. And so with this, it's not that, yes, with a multivitamin that you can get your uh, vitamins and minerals and some different nutrients without a high caloric intake. But for the most part, if we're talking about food, it is going to be that foods that are macronutrients. So let's say something like a protein, which let's just go with like chicken thighs, they can have micronutrients in them. So it's not that, okay, there's food that have macronutrients and there's food that have micronutrients. There's going to be food and food has macro and micronutrients in it, depending on what the food is. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should squat after It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Our next question is, which macronutrients provide energy? A little bit of a trick question there because all of them do. Okay. How so? All macros are providing energy to the body and are supporting all of your bodily functions. So it just is going to depend on how concentrated that is. So fats are going to be the most concentrated form of energy because, like you said, they have nine grams or nine calories per gram in them. Uh, but each and every macro is going to help with providing energy to our bodies and being able to fuel us. The carbohydrates are going to be the, the most useful for us. It's going to be something where with fats, it's going to have a longer process of breakdown. So if we're needing a more readily available energy source for us, carbohydrates are going to be our best option. Protein can also be utilized for energy. It's the probably the most expensive process for us to go through when we look at the three macronutrients. Carbohydrates, least expensive. Fat's going to be the middle most expensive. And then protein's going to be the most expensive. And what I mean by most expensive is going to be the energy that is taken to break these things down. And so protein is going to be used for energy when it is broken down to ketones. And it is only broken down to ketones when it is breaking down stored muscle tissue. And the only time that this is going to happen is if we're taking in an insufficient amount of calories. And so if someone has been in a very deep deficit, think of, of a situation maybe where they're taking in less than 1,200 calories over time, and you're very consistent in that, not someone who's, I'm eating 1,200 calories three days a week, and then four days a week, I'm eating 4,000 calories. <laughs> That's not that person. But someone who has truly been at that low intake for an extended period of time, they may run into the situation where they're now stealing from their stored protein or their muscle density to create energy for themselves by the breakdown of protein into ketones. Done deal. Uh, should I avoid carbs? Should you avoid carbs? This is a, an interesting question because uh, it's going to be dependent on the person. And now it's like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to categorize myself with whatever Alex says here of now, because he said that I should be avoiding carbs. And for the vast majority of you, you should not be avoiding carbs. I do believe that individuals who have maybe let's, let's, create a, a scenario because this is better for overall nutrition because nutrition is going to be so specific to the person, but let's create an, an avatar. We have someone who is overweight, um, for them to get into a place, they need to lose, let's say 50 pounds. 
They have not been resistance training. They have not been tracking their nutrients. They have a ton of stored glycogen in their body. That individual, it's probably best that they have more of a moderate to low carbohydrate intake and that carbohydrate intake being around their physical activity. That's going to be best for that particular person because they're going to probably be in an insulin resistant position to utilize the carbohydrates that they're taking in because of the excess that they have circulating through their body and stored in different cells. And so that person may need to avoid avoid, I'm using air quotes, mm -hmm. avoid carbs more in the, in the grand scheme and bias more of their calories towards fats and protein. But for someone who has been consistently resistance training and maybe they're wanting to lose body fat to, to feel better, look better, perform better. And it's like 10 to 15 pounds, certainly not a situation where someone is needing to avoid carbs by any means. Mm -hmm. And carbs just are very tasty. They're tasty. And they help like fuel your gym performance. And like you said, they are the most readily available source of energy. And so if you are in a place where you aren't extremely overweight or have 50 plus pounds to lose, then they're going to be a huge benefit to you, your gym performance, your muscle growth, your mood, your brain function, it's going to be really positive. So I think that being able to build that avatar and looking at what it is, what's the circumstance, how do we need to take the term relative to towards this and really look at the different factors going into it? Absolutely. Um, looking more at, at protein, how does protein or how does low protein intake impact our ability to build muscle? Well, you see, protein is the building block for all cells in our body. And it is going to be the number one thing that you need in place to build and maintain your muscle mass. So even if you do not want to build more muscle, if you want to maintain the muscle mass that you have on your body, protein is going to be astronomically important to that. And it's also something where it is going to help with satiation. It's going to help with energy, like we talked about. And it is going to, since it affects every cell in the body, contribute to you living and feeling the most efficient version of yourself internally because everything is functioning the way that it needs to. Think about the the scenario in which you have you know tissue that needs to be repaired. We're um, we're working out. We're doing different activities throughout our day. We're having a little bit of of breakdown to the muscle tissue. Protein is going to be an integral part to that. And as Sue talks about, if we don't have that protein in place, that breakdown is just going to lead to a weaker muscle tissue or, or whatever the case may be. And so, being mindful of that and keeping that in in the back of your head is advantageous as you're looking at your total protein intake. And this is another huge thing. Let's say that you're in a deficit. And one thing that I always like to point out is that you don't just want to lose weight. You want to lose fat because if you just lose weight, then you can end up losing muscle. And then you end up with like the skinny fat look that a lot of people don't want. And so it is going to be so, so huge with being able to not only fuel your gym performance, but being able to allow you to look the way that you likely want to look. If you want to look toned, if you want to look jacked, if you want to look anything in between those two, you are going to need protein in place. And we have seen this time and time again with clients and just, you know, out in the wild of protein is going to make the difference in your body composition of really being able to look and perform the way that you want to. And I think the the satiation point can't be driven home enough where where, where we have adequate protein per meal, the time of, of hunger and actually being satiated from meal to meal is, is so much better. Oh, I, it's I, night and day. If I was to have meals that were just carbohydrate and fat dense, I was to have, a, you know, I think about donuts, I think about cereal, those two things, I could have a, a big dense breakfast of those two things and I will be hungry in about 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. If I have a great breakfast with, let's say, 40 to 50 grams of protein and moderate carbs and moderate fat, I am good for at least three hours, at least. And I'm not thinking about food. And I, I find that so many people who are, are experiencing food focus are having either snacks or meals that are very carbohydrate and fat dense with very minimal protein. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we get that switch in place, a lot of things change for them. Like, oh my gosh, this is such a weight off of my shoulders because I felt like I was just thinking about food all the freaking time. And now, you know, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. 
If you want to learn more about protein, I will have another video linked down below, just being able to go all over protein, give you some different protein sources um, and more, just so in case it's something that feels like a sticking point for you, being able to get that in. Absolutely. All right. Next up, how does nutrition affect muscle growth? It's the... I don't know. Can you say that there's a most important piece? It's one of those things where everything matters and you have nutrition, you have your training, you have your sleep, you have hormonal function, all these things being top priority to maximize muscle growth. Because when we look at putting on real muscle tissue, your body is is not needing that. You're going to have to force that adaptation to happen. And in that forcing of adaptation and training really hard, the only way that that adaptation is going to happen. You're going to strengthen the tissue and have the resources to do it is that you have nutrition in place and you have adequate protein, you have adequate calories to perform in the gym and all those different things. And so I would say, understanding that, that the, the nutrition is the most important part. And so without nutrition, you're not going to be able to put on the muscle that you desire or really any muscle at all. Yeah. And I've actually noticed that firsthand, especially this past year um, with you referring of like your body has to fight to add that muscle on of you had talked about it in the past of how hard it was to keep up with food to maintain the muscle mass you were trying to build. And I kind of was like, okay, sure. I'm sure that that's happening. But then I recognized of, oh crap, I have to really be on top of this nutrition for the muscle I'm trying to build and trying to like push towards. And so often people get in the mindset, if I just train hard enough in the gym, then I'm going to yield the results that I want. And it is not just the gym. It is hand in hand. That is why people say that training and nutrition go hand in hand. Because like you said, of if you think about it in the way of if you don't have that nutrition, you're not going to see the results. It's the same the other way, though, of if you aren't training with intensity and the proper execution, you're not going to see the muscle growth either, even if your food is locked down. So you can't have one without the other. They have to work together to get you where you want to go. I will say you probably will feel better oh, if, for sure. if you have nutrition in check, for but sure. don't have training in check. If you have training in check, but don't have nutrition in check, you're going to feel like trash Dogged all it. the time. You're going to feel like trash all the time. Yeah. So um, if I had to pick one or the other for feel good reasons, mm -hmm. I would say have nutrition in check and not training. <laughs> <laughs> I would very much so agree with that. <laughs> Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. All right. How does nutrition differ from a caloric intake? I think this is, is one where we can have more dialogue in general because I, I, this is something where there's there's just a, a lot to talk about because nutrition is so much more vast than the calories that you're intaking because I can get the calories from all kinds of different food, but am I getting the adequate micronutrients? How am I feeling after the meals? Uh, how is my digestion? How am I supporting my um, my energy, my mental health, my digest, all the different factors like that goes into nutrition. That's not just calorie intake. And so I think that you are, are a great example of this uh, uh, to talk on it more so because of how deep dive or how much of a deep dive you've taken into digestion and, and those different things. I think that the concept of people, I think that words that are good to talk about here are diet, nutrition, and calories. Because oftentimes people think that the word diet means that they are dieting, but a diet is just 
the food that you eat. And so when we look at calories, it's something where Calories are a way to measure the energy and the energy released into the body, but a calorie isn't a nutrient but certain nutrients provide calories for the body. And so it's being able to look at it and see that just because something is low calorie doesn't mean that it is good nutrition. And just because something is high calorie doesn't mean that it's bad nutrition. I think nutrition is very all-encompassing of what it looks like for the nutrients, the type of food, and how that food truly makes you feel when it comes to the calories that you are eating. Do you have any examples? Think like think about, I, I feel like diet foods are a good example. Could you think of diet foods that are maybe nice from a caloric perspective, but not great from a nutrient perspective? Mm, I would say something like shredded lettuce. Mm. And even though I, I use that example specifically because a lot of people might be like, I'm eating lettuce, so I'm healthy. But shredded lettuce is basically just a lot of water and it doesn't have a ton of nutrients in it. And a lot of times people use that to volume eat and they're thinking, I'm eating this vegetable, this is so good for me, but it's not providing like a ton of nutrients where something like spinach is going to provide a lot of nutrients and it's still going to be lower calorie altogether. Um, some other diet foods, is there one that you had specifically in mind? I just think of like the remakes of normal food mm -hmm. that people just throw in a bunch of artificial sweeteners and different volumizing components that are not great for their gut, mm -hmm. um, but they, from a caloric perspective, end up being good for them and it's more satiating because it is so volumizing or whatever the yeah. case may be. I would say a lot of foods that are labeled as sugar-free because oftentimes sugar-free foods are then replaced with an artificial sweetener. And I want to make a disclaimer that artificial sweeteners are not inherently bad, and it's not that I'm sitting here demonizing them. Some people can have artificial sweeteners and they have no impact on them or their gut. Some other people, myself included, as soon as I have something with an artificial sweetener, it does tear up my gut. And those are ones that people go to because they're like, oh, it's sugar-free or it's low sugar, or then I am going to be able to eat so much more of it. But then they put themselves in this place where possibly those artificial sweeteners are just causing a really bad gut environment. And it's something where that person is just searching for fullness. And so they turn towards those sugar-free options. One that came to mind was fat-free cheese. Oh, yeah. That scares me. It does a little bit. I used to eat it. When I, when I first started tracking macros, mm -hmm. fat-free cheese was the goat because it was just, it was literally just protein. I don't even know how they make it, to be honest with you. You know, it's so funny because when you asked me about diet foods, I, my mind kind of blanked because I just, I, for the past, I want to say like four plus years, I haven't had any diet foods. Yeah. Like I haven't gone towards these foods to try to make dieting easier. I've just kind of accepted that there's a certain degree of hunger that I'm going to have while dieting. And that just is what it is. Of course, there's ways around that within planning your food and being more conscientious of how food is digesting and how you're feeling fullness wise. But it's not been something that I'm like, oh, I need to go out and get all these different foods. It's like, I'm just going to eat the foods I eat in a little bit of a smaller quantity. Yeah. I, well, I think that's a massive golden nugget for people to take from this. If you are getting into a dieting phase, there is just a level of hunger that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Like it, it's silly to think that you're going to feel satiated and full when you are intentionally eating less calories than what your body needs to lose the current body fat that you're carrying. Yeah. But to somehow think you're going to be full is crazy. Yeah. And I mean, dieting doesn't have to suck, yeah. but it also there is going to be hunger. And so often people are not okay with having hunger that they just turn to having that comfort or having that fullness of feeling. Uh, but I think it's just part of the game. Well, I mean, think about how many people, like as soon as they're hungry, that's like a negative response mm -hmm. and they have to get it, you know, away. Like all their life, they just go that, 
that route of if I'm hungry, I need to eat to full satiation. And that's just kind of the loop that they've always had. So hunger has always served as this negative feedback for them Mm -hmm. that needs to be corrected right away. And then as soon as someone has better control over their nutrition and actually is, is having natural hunger signaling, they're like, oh my gosh, this is a bunch of negative feedback loop that I'm getting. And so it's like retraining that thought process is, you know, takes time. It's not something that's just going to happen right off the bat. So if you're in that, you know, <laughs> arena, give yourself some grace. I think this is a great question here. How to eat before and after training, aka peri workout nutrition? So, this is going to vary depending on what time you're training. So, we'll start with the early morning crowd because I, I do feel like each time we answer this question, that's the first question that we receive in response. So, for the person who is training first thing in the morning, 4 30, 5, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to encourage hydration and electrolytes. That is that is it. If you can get some light food in place, maybe some whey protein and some fruit would be a good idea. Those two things would be advantageous. If not, water and electrolytes is going to be the answer. Having a more dense carbohydrate meal as your dinner is going to be ideal. So if you were to structure this out and we talk about in the, you know, in this portion where we want to have 20 to 30 percent of our total carb intake for the day in our pre-workout meal and then also in our post-workout meal. So at bare minimum, 40 percent of our carbohydrate intake is going to be accounted for with that pre and post-workout meal. All you're going to do is take that pre-workout meal and put it as the last meal of the day prior. That is how I would approach it if you're training early in the morning. And then your post-workout meal is going to stay the same, 20 to 30% of your carbohydrate daily intake, and then your fats need to be between 5 and 15% um, of the total daily intake. And then protein needs to be at a minimum of 25 grams, and I would say 25 to 50 grams is a good spot to be in. Mm-hmm. For the individual who is going to be training midday, you lucky dogs, training one o'clock, something like that, having a, a meal two to three hours prior to your training is probably going to be the best route for you. Still prioritizing hydration, still being in a place where you've got adequate electrolytes salting your meals well, that is what I would advise. And then your post-workout meal needs to be within two hours of the completion of your training. It doesn't have to be immediate. What what about what about my anabolic window? Anabolic window. I have to be slamming a protein shake as I'm literally finishing the last rep. <laughs> not true. <laughs> what? Those are facts. Unfortunately, or well, the fortunately, it's not. <laughs> uh, Miguel and I have actually made a very funny uh, piece of content on this that didn't get the amount of love that it I thought it should have. have. It should have gotten. More I've love. been toying with the idea of reposting it. I think I may just repost it every day until it does I get the adequate should. love I think it deserves. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So within two hours, but really getting to a restful state within your heart rate is going to be a big thing because we want digestion to be optimized. And if we're in a higher heart rate, something closer to what we would be training at 110, 120 plus beats per minute while we're trying to eat, probably not the best place to be. Mm -hmm. And so getting within 10 beats per minute of your resting heart rate before consuming the meal um, is a helpful tool. Now, let's say that you aren't wearing a heart rate monitor. You're not wearing a watch. You're not wearing anything of the sort. What I would encourage prior to eating your meal is just to go through some, some deep breathing, going like three seconds in through the nose, pause for one to three seconds, and then three seconds out through the mouth, and then going through that sequence maybe five to 10 times. And that's probably going to get you to a, a, a settle spot of, of where your heart rate needs to be for you to be able to eat. So I even go through that. I just happened last night where I was super hungry, like I had waited a little bit long, too long to eat. And when I get in those places, then I often eat way too fast and then give myself a stomach ache. And so I sat there and with my food in front of me, I just ran through some breaths so that I could like calm down myself to be able to get into a place that I wasn't just absolutely shoving food into my face. It's much easier said than done. Oh, for sure. 
Because I have lots of self control because I just wanted to eat. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's honestly fun to be that hungry and just shovel food down your mouth. <laughs> it's a really cool experience. I mean, it's a nice oh experience. Gosh. Post is not the best. Yeah. But in the moment, it is fun. And that is a problem. <laughs> I will also say one other thing for if you are training early in the morning is that intra workout could yeah. be a great option and it doesn't have to be food. In fact, I implore you to make it not food because eating while you're touching all the gym equipment just seems a little bit out there to me. But Mike's Mix, you can get it on Amazon. They send you like a huge bag. It lasts for forever. And it's basically one gram of carb per one gram of powder. And it is tasteless. You can just throw it into a drink that has some flavoring in it. And you'll be good to go just being able to have some carbs for energy uh, throughout your workout. And that's even something if you have waited a little bit too long before your training session. So with Alex saying those time frames of before your workout, it's going to be two to three hours. The further away from training, the bigger the meal can be. The closer to training, the smaller the meal will be because you want to make sure that you have mostly digested the food before you go into a fight or flight mindset. Because when you're training, you are in fight or flight and that's where you want to be. But when we're eating, we want to be in rest and digest. And so it's something where if you are about to train, you don't want to eat this huge meal and be like, it's that exact breakdown they told me to, but you're walking into the gym 30 minutes later. It's being able to be intelligent about how close am I to training and what do I need to eat. And if it is something where you're like, oh man, I'm like right on the edge of needing to eat another meal, but I need to train now. That's where I'll normally use an intra so I don't have to stop and eat a meal and then have to prolong my training. I'll just be able to have that in place to ensure I have enough energy to get through the session. I can give some further rule of thumbs, if you will. I would say the minimum time with having a full meal will be 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like if you're gonna follow these guidelines, 90 minutes. Let's say you're 60 minutes out from a session and you are, you're hungry, you need to get something in, I would go with things that are gonna be easier digestion, kind of similar to what I talked about with the morning training session. So a protein powder, uh, maybe some rice cakes, maybe some uh, fruit with that. So eat things that are gonna sit well with your stomach and again, be easy to digest. Okay, this one is uh, three questions wrapped into one. Okay. All right. The first question, do you feel different if you eat healthy? Number two, does nutrition affect mood? And then number three, does poor nutrition affect mental health? Okay. So do you feel, what was it? Do different you feel different? If you eat healthy. Well, are, how are we how are we categorizing healthy and not healthy? I would like to, the question to actually be reframed of do you feel do you feel different eating more whole foods? How about that? Okay. Cuz I, well, I mean, what would you say? No, I agree. I think that the term healthy is hard because it is a very easily recognizable term of like, okay, healthy versus not healthy. But I think that the term healthy can be used incorrectly. And so people then just whenever they hear something phrased as healthy, they think it's good for them. And I think that good nutrition can be different than what people classify as healthy or quote unquote unhealthy food, just like people classify foods as good and bad. And so I do agree with you of like, do you feel differently if you eat nutritious foods or if you eat whole foods, um, might be more descriptive than saying, do you feel different if you eat healthy? Yeah. So do I feel differently eating more whole foods? I certainly do. I feel more satiated from the meals. I feel more energetic. I feel like my digestion is better. I feel like my ability to go from thing to eating, eating to back to doing a thing is much better. I feel as though if I am going from doing something and I go to eat a, a meal that's not as nutrient dense or, or whole food based, and it's a little bit more hyper palatable, for example, um, and then I try to go do something, it's very difficult for me to focus on the thing. Like my blood sugars are elevated more than what they would be with more whole foods and they're not sitting as well with my stomach. And so I just have a trouble with that. And in my day-to-day -day life, the most important thing for me is being able to go from thing to thing and stay on, on track. And so 
it like whole foods impact my day tremendously and um, affects how I feel a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I wrapped all of these three into one, because they're all talking about how you feel or how your mood is. And nutrition is going to 100% affect your mood, how you feel, your mental health, your concentration, your focus, and honestly, even your level of happiness. And a big part of this is that nutri nutritional deficiencies like having uh, vitamin B12 or B9, which is folate, um, and zinc, if you have deficiencies in those vitamins and minerals, then they can cause symptoms of depression and dementia, uh, like things like low mood, fatigue, cognitive decline decline and irritability. And there have been studies shown that eating too many highly processed foods has been shown to increase the likelihood of anxiety and increase the risk of developing depression. Um, and so I think that it is so important when we talk about uh, food and nutrient-dense food that it's not just about oh, this is how your physique can look, or it's not just someone pushing an agenda of you should eat this, not that. It's truly that what you eat determines how you feel and how your mental well-being is. And I think that that cannot be overstated enough because far too often, I mean, if we look at the top five leading causes of death in the United States, all of them have a diet-related aspect. And that's not to say that diet tit-for-tat causes each one of them, but each of them can be improved with a diet aspect and they can be worse with a diet aspect. And so I think that we need to look at food and look at what it can do for us and not just say, this is tasty to me. And that's not me saying you should never eat a fucking cookie again because I am pro-cookie for sure. I love sweets. I I love so much food as a whole, and that's why I love to talk about it, and I love people seeing what I eat because even just the other day, I got a comment of, oh, I didn't know you were allowed to eat that, and I forget that people think that way just because I'm not always surrounded by people that think that way, but they think that eating healthy means that it has to be restrictive and they cannot have foods that they like anymore, and that is simply not the case, but it also does not mean that there is not a change to the way that you eat. Because just because I might enjoy foods like pizza or ice cream or cheesecake doesn't mean that that is my whole diet and that I don't eat other things outside of that. It is that I eat whole nutritious foods and then I also have things like pizza or cookies or cheesecake. And it's something that I just think needs to be a higher focus for people to have less illness and for people to feel better because I have fallen into the aspect of my mental health of I went through time, especially in college, where the alcohol wasn't helping, but it was also the type of foods that I was eating. And I was very depressed to a place that I didn't understand. I don't even recognize that version of myself. And so much of it had to do what I was feeding myself. And that's not talked about enough. And people are just given medicine and told that it's going to make them feel better. And I think that we should look at our food a lot more than we are, we do right now. Amen. I'm passionate about it. <laughs> you could not tell. <laughs> Rightfully so. I agree. It makes such a big difference from a mental health standpoint. Well, that feels like a good one to end on, but we will have a part two. So if you have any questions, we already have some that we have ready to go for the next time. But if you have any questions about something that we talked about or any other nutrition questions, then feel free to reach out to us and share this with a friend that you think might be confused about nutrition or might need to hear something that we talk about here. And if you personally feel very lost with nutrition, and even though this podcast might have given you a lot of information and you feel like you're on the right path, but you need help implementing it, you need guidance on your journey to learn about food, then I will have a link down below to be able to get on a free call with our enrollment advisor, Lauren, who is absolutely incredible, and just be able to talk about you, what's going on, what you need help with to see if we're going to be a good fit to be able to get you that help. Catch you in the next one.